Paramahansa Paravajika Chaya Savdar Shishi Maharaj Divine Grace Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj Akija Ananti Guri Vaishnavinda Akija Nama Charis Lahadadas Thako Akija Prem Sikha Ho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhuna Chananda Shri Advaita Gadadar Shri Vasudhi Gaura Bhakti Vrinda Akija Shri Shri Radha Krishna Go Gopinath Shama Kunda Radha Kunda Giri Govadam Akija Vrindavan Dham Akija Nabadip Mai Pur Dham Akija Ganga Jamunamai Akija Tulasi Devi Maharani Akija Samaveda Bhakti Vrinda Akija Harinam Sankirtan Akija Brihat Madanga Ki Jai. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to Shri Shri Guru and Garanga. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. <coughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So, reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, third canto, eighth chapter, text number 12. Is it up there? Okay, I'll, I'll start chanting, and if it goes up there, everybody could join in. Chatur Yuganam Chasahasramapsu Chatur Yuganam Chasahasramapsu Swapan Swayodirataya Swalshaktya Swapan Swayo Dirataya Swa Sakya Kilakya Yasadita Karma Tantra Kalakya Yasadita Karma Tantra Lokan Apitan Dadrise Swadehe Lokan Apitan Dadrise Swadehe Chato Yuganam Chasahasram Apsu Swapan Swayodirataya Swasakya Kalakya Yasadita Karma Tantra Lokan Apitan Dadrase Swadehe
Vaishnavis. Okay, Chatu four, Yuganam of the millenniums, Cha also, Sahasram one thousand, Apsu in the water, Swapan dreaming in sleep, Swaya with his internal potency. Udhidataya for further development. Swasakya by his own energy. Kala Aktyaya by the name Kala. Asadita being so engaged. Karma Tantra in the matter of fruit of activities. Lokan, the total living entities. Apitan, bluish. Dadrase, <clears throat> saw it so. Swadehe, in his own body. Translation. The Lord lay down for 4,000 yuga cycles in his internal potency. And by his external energy, he appeared to be sleeping within the water. When the living entities were coming out from, for further development of their fruit of activities, actuated by the energy called Kala Shakti, he saw his transcendental body as bluish, purport. In the Vishnu Purana, Kala Shakti is mentioned as avidya. The symptom of the influence of the Kala Shakti is that one has to work in the material world for fruit of results. The fruit of workers are described in Bhagavad Gita as mudhas or foolish. Such foolish living entities are very enthusiastic to work for some temporary benefit within perpetual bondage. One thinks himself very clever throughout his life if he is able to leave behind him a great asset of wealth for his children and to achieve this temporary benefit, he takes the risk of all sinful activities without knowledge that such activities will keep him perpetually bound by the shackles of material bondage. Due to this polluted mentality and due to material sins, the aggregate combination of living entities appear to be bluish such an impetus of activity for fruit of result is made possible by the dictation of the external energy of the Lord, Kala. Om Gina Timaram Desha Jananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Melitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurdave Namaha Shri Chaitanamano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Upakadam Ayam Didati Swapadantikam 
So the title of this chapter is Manifestation of Brahma from Vishnu. So Brahma is not yet manifest. And uh, that makes sense with what's stated in the translation because it mentions that the Lord lay down for 4,000 yuga cycles and his internal potency. So as if this was just the period in between Brahma's day and Brahma's night, you know, because like, we know at the night, every, of, you know, every Brahma has a day that lasts Sahasra Yuga Pariyantam for a thousand cycles of the four Yugas. And his night is the same period. And during the night of Brahma, all the living entities merge. They are, well, it's in the Bhagavad Gita Purport Papa, it says they're compact in the body of Vishnu, Garbhadakshai Vishnu. But this is referring to a longer period. This is saying 4,000 4, yuga cycles in his internal potency. So, but that can be understood because, as I mentioned, this, the, the title of this chapter is The Manifestation of Brahma from Vishnu. It's before. This is before Brahma has even appeared. He hasn't been born yet, so to speak. So this is describing that. And it's saying how, in the translation again, uh, the Lord, he appeared to be asleep. So you know, he wasn't actually asleep, but he appeared such. And um, he saw his transcendental body as bluish. And in the purport, there's some mention about, there's, there's some relationship between the Lord seeing his transcendental body as bluish and uh, the consciousness of the uh, living entities, the conditioned souls, which are at that time within his body. It says here, due to this polluted mentality, and due to material sins, the aggregate combination of living entities appeared to be bluish. So there's some connection there uh, between the Lord seeing his transcendental body as bluish and the, uh, you know, the, com the aggregate combination of the living entities appearing to be bluish as a result of their polluted mentality and due to material sins. Um, so... Rather, I thought that the greatest benefit could be derived from our class this morning by rather than getting really into uh, the details, you know, like an analysis or a very uh, detailed analysis of the, uh, this description of the, an early part of the creation, we'd be, you know, more benefit would be derived by just talking about what's the purpose. There's, why is this going on in the first place? It's going on, and it's being described here, and we're getting some details, but why is it going on? What's, what's, you know, what's the purpose here? Why is Garbhadakshai Vishnu lying down on Sheshanag and uh, appearing to be asleep, and, uh, you know, but he's not... Uh, what, what's, you know, what's the purpose behind all this? And we know from other things we've heard that Garbhadakshai Vishnu is manifest, manifested by Karanadakshai Vishnu. You know, he enters in, Karanadakshai Vishnu breathes out the universes and he enters into each universe as Garbhadakshai Vishnu and we're hearing about that. So, what's, you know, why? What, what's, what's going on here? I mean, is, this just, is Krishna just trying to uh, show off? You know, people like to show off. Look what I can do. You think that's what's going on? Krishna's just showing off? Well, I don't think so. And that's not what the Acharyas say. This is what the Acharyas say about what's going, what's the purpose? What's the purpose behind this whole in incredible, elaborate, incredible, inconceivable arrangement that we're hearing being described here? So these are some thoughts about that, that from uh, Prabhupada. So this first one is just a few sentences from the, uh, from the same third canto, fifth chapter, actually just a few chapters ago, where Prabhupada says, the Lord wanted to create the cosmic manifestation to give another chance to the conditioned souls who were dormant in forgetfulness. And we're hearing about these souls, they're dormant in forgetfulness, and they're just kind of waking up now you know, we're hearing in this purport, and they're getting real restless and ready to get out there again and do their fruit of activities. But so, 
The cosmic manifestation is, is meant to give those souls uh, who are dormant in forgetfulness um, a chance. The cosmic manifestation gives the conditioned souls a chance to go back home, back to Godhead. And that is its main purpose. That's its main purpose. Its secondary purpose is to give them a chance to do their thing and get their results. And, but the real purpose is, or the main purpose and the real purpose is to give them a chance to go back to Godhead. The Lord is so kind that in the absence of such a manifestation, he feels something wanting, and thus the creation takes place. And then a little bit further on, the purpose is the whole process is to enliven the sleeping conditioned souls to the real life of spiritual consciousness so that they may thus become as perfect as the ever-liberated souls in the Vaikuntha Lokas. See, so in other words, Krishna is uh, you know, not happy about the fact that some of his parts and parcels are conditioned souls and are, as mentioned here, are dormant in forgetfulness and he wants to give them a chance to get back into devotional service again, which they may or may not take advantage of, but Krishna is very merciful and he wants to give them a He feels bad. Krishna feels bad if, if he's not making some arrangement to give them a chance to come back to devotional service. So a little bit further on that. There's a, uh, in, in the ninth chapter, which is the next chapter, well, actually, this is a, this is a little couple sentences from a, uh, the first canto. It says, the Lord wants the suffering human beings to come back home, back to him, and cease to suffer the threefold miseries. This sense, the whole plan of creation is made in that way. So once again, confirming this same point, the whole plan of creation is just to help the conditioned souls go back to Godhead. Now, in, in the next chapter coming up, there's a very nice verse, and some of you might be familiar with this verse, who do deity worship. I believe it's still used. Um, so savadabra karuno bhagavan vrivita prema smritena nayanam buduham vrijimbam utaya vishva vijayaya chano vishadam madhya gira parayatat purusha parana. Do you still chant that? Oh, they don't. Well, when I was trained up in deity worship, I was... Yeah, the translation of that is that the Lord is the original, per he's the oldest, he's the original person, and he's uh, unlimitedly merciful. And Lord Brahma is praying about Lord Brahma, and he's praying that uh, the Lord uh, smilingly bestow his benediction upon us. And then he goes on to say that he can enliven the entire creation by speaking his directions. So it's a prayer by Lord Brahma. And uh, when I was taught deity worship, I was, when you, to wake up the deities, that was the first thing you did. You went there and you rang the bell, and when you, as you were ringing the bell, you chanted that prayer, and there's a couple other ones as well. So I always remembered that. And uh, so this is what Prabhupada says as in, the, in his purport to that verse, that text in the ninth canto, sorry, ninth chapter of the third, this third canto. He says, the Lord is ever increasingly merciful upon the fallen souls of this material world. And here it is again. Remember, we, we, got in, we launched into this whole discussion because I was saying we should try to understand the purpose underlying the creation. So here it comes again. The whole cosmic manifestation is a chance for all to improve themselves in devotional service to the Lord. And everyone is meant for that purpose. The Lord gives the fallen souls the chance to for this highest perfection of life. So once again, that, uh, that's the purpose, to help the conditioned souls go back to Godhead. And uh, so this is a, 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 a manifestation or an exhibition of Krishna's causeless mercy. In the, um, I think it's the 80th chapter, maybe it's the 87th chapter of the Krishna book, there's the ch uh, title, it's entitled The Prayers of the Personified Vedas. I'm not sure if it's chapter, I think it's chapter 87, I'm not positive. But um, the personified Vedas, Shruti Ganas, is, is their name in Sanskrit. So they're praying, they're praying to the Lord and they're glorifying him. And they make this statement that, um, you know, all glories to you, Lord, by your own transcendental nature, you fully possess all six opulences. As such, you are able to deliver all the conditioned souls from the clutches of Maya. Oh Lord, we fervently pray that you kindly do so. So they're praying to the Lord in this way. And Prabhupada, commenting upon that prayer of the personified Vedas, says, um, 
of all his glories, the most important, referring to the Lord, is his causeless mercy upon the conditioned souls and reclaiming them from the clutches of Maya. So the cosmic manifestation is an opportunity for the conditioned souls to go back to Godhead. Uh, the motivation, Krishna's motivation behind it is he's merciful. You know, it's his closest mercy is his greatest glory, as we just heard here. Statement of the personified Vedas and elaborated upon by Srila Prabhupada. And um, in a lecture, actually, that Prabhupada gave on the teachings of Lord Kapila, which was later uh, uh, transcribed and made into a book, that Prabhupada said this. He said, um, because we have forgotten Krishna, Krishna has given us all these Vedas and Puranas. Krishna also comes into this material world in order to remi remind us of himself. In this Kali Yuga, people are forgetting Krishna more and more. They are, not even, they are not even interested in him. But Krishna is interested because we are his sons. A mad son may no longer be interested in his home and his father or mother. <clears throat> Yet the father never loses interest in his son. He is anxious because his boy has left home and is suffering. Similarly, Krishna's sons leave the spiritual sky and take up one material body after another and in this way travel from one planet uh, to another in different species of life. Therefore, Krishna comes to rescue them. So it's just a further elaboration upon Krishna's mood. You know, his greatest glory is his causeless mercy. That's you know, the whole purpose of his cosmic manifestation is to help the conditioned souls come back to pure devotional service. It's Krishna's mercy, and this is, that was further describing his, his mood. He sees all the parts and parcels as his beloved sons, etc., and he wants them back, you know, despite the fact that they don't want to come back. As he, Prabhupada says here, people are not even interested. But despite that fact, despite being ignored by the people he's trying to help, by the souls he's trying to help, Krishna is determined. Actually, he's so determined that um, in the eighth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a purport where Prabhupada says, and this is really interesting, elaborates on this point, only Krishna can deliver us from this material existence. Indeed, he is always trying to deliver us. He is within our hearts and is not at all inattentive. His only aim within this material world, his only aim is to deliver us from material life. It is not that he becomes attentive to us only when we offer prayers to him, even before we offer our prayers, he incessantly tries to deliver us. He is never lazy in regard to, to our deliverance. And because of this, he's called Buri Karunaya, which means unlimitedly merciful in delivering the uh, fallen conditioned souls back home, back to Godhead. So, um, so it's just taking it one step further. It's, it's pointing out that not only, only Krishna can deliver us, but it's his, his only aim and being here in the material world is to deliver us. And here, this is a really interesting sentence here. It says, even, uh, it is not that he becomes attentive to us only when we offer prayers to him. Even before we offer our prayers, he incessantly tries to deliver us. Okay, so I'm going to go off on, on what I hope is a little bit, what, what, I, what I would refer to as a transcendental tangent. I hope it's transcendental tangent right at this point. And um, kind of digress from, you know, the, what I've been talking about up to this point, to make another point. Papa says that even before we offer prayers, so I've been reading this purport for years, and whenever I read that phrase, I always think, oh yeah, even before we offer prayers. So what Papa means by that is there's people out there who aren't devotees, and they're not offering prayers, and you know, so Krishna's concerned about getting them back to Godhead. Because you know, even before they're offering their prayers, Krishna's concerned about getting them back to Godhead. And I, and, uh, I was re just reflecting upon that this morning. I was thinking, well, of course, that's correct, but it goes even further than that. That's true. That's true, that those people out there who aren't devotees yet, and they're not, you know, they're not, they're, they're not even interested in Krishna, as we just heard, they're not offering prayers. But he, so even, bef even before they offer their prayers, Krishna's incessantly trying to deliver them. But it just occurred to me this morning, as a result of studying for this, you know, today's class, that it goes way further back than that. Even when, the, you know, when the souls are in the body of Garbhadakshai Vishnu, Krishna is incessantly trying to deliver them. You know, way before we offer prayers, you know, way back when we're, you know, as soon as we become conditioned souls, 
which, and you know, going back that far, Krishna's trying to offer prayers. Okay, now here's the real point that I'm trying to make. Um, Vaisheshika Prabhu has a, I don't know if you call it a club, and it's called Become a Sage, page by page. Does anybody here remember that club? Raise your hand. So I think in that club, to be a member of that club, you've got to read 40 pages of the Bhagavatam every day. Is that right? Something like that. Become a sage page by page. That's a good club. I think that's, that's a good idea to read 40 pages of the Bhagavatam every day. And I'd like to add something, which I think could, you know, to that whole, to that club. We should become sages by, you know, page by pages like that. But we should also become a nerd, word by word. It's good to become a sage page by page. We should read 40 pages of the day, a day of the Bhagavatam. That's good. But in addition to that, on top of that, we should become a nerd word by word. And I'll explain what I mean by that. There's, I looked up in the uh, dictionary the definition of the word nerd. There was two definitions. Sorry? Yeah, that's, that, that, that's what I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell you right now. In the dictionary, there were two, two definitions for the word nerd. Uh, the old definition was like a nerd was like somebody who was kind of like dysfunctional and, you know, they, 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 sometimes they give a sentence to uh, explain it, like a guy who never asked a girl to dance or something like that. You know, somebody who was just out of place and awkward. That's the old definition of a nerd. But the modern day definition of a nerd is this, and this is, what I'm, this is the one I'm, I meant, intended to be understood. Nerd is somebody who engages in discussion Somebody who discusses a technical field obsessively with great attention to detail, that kind of nerd. We should become that kind of nerd about Srila Prabhupada's words. See, so become a nerd word by word about Prabhupada's words. We should become nerds about Prabhupada's words. And the, yeah, and the reason for that is this, that Prabhupada's words are special. Papa's words are very special. See, the, the spiritual master, we know these things. The spiritual master is the external manifestation of the super soul, saksha, dadit vain, asamasta sastra, you know. He, is, has, he has power attorney, power of attorney from Krishna. So when you give somebody power of attorney, that means they can conduct business on your behalf. They can represent you. And what they say goes. You know, if, if somebody has power of attorney for you and they do some th transaction on your behalf, that's binding. You know, they have the power of attorney. So what they say, they're representing you. So anyway, the point is, Prabhupada is representing Krishna. His words are transcendentally powerful, potent. They're pregnant with not just the siddhanta of the philosophy, which they are, they're pregnant with the siddhanta of the philosophy, the correct understanding of the philosophy. But even beyond that, they're pregnant with like all sorts of rasa, feeling. It's all in there. It's all in Prabhupada's words. Everything, Prabhupada's words are like, boom. They're like, you know, you just, if you, that's why I'm saying become a nerd word by word, by word on Prabhupada's words because everything's there in Prabhupada's words. And, and when you, it's good. Become a sage page by page. Read 40 pages. But don't just... Blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, what would you read? I don't remember. Nothing. No. Zero in. We've got to zero in on Prabhupada's words. And when you do that, that's meditation. And then what happens is you get... That's, what, that's why in the Bhagavad Gita it says, Nitya Nava Nava. You know, it doesn't say in it's someplace in the Bhagavatam. It's ever fresh. You see, we, the, the more you focus and think about, what, what does Prabhupada mean by that and everything you get great, more insights, continually new insights. I'll give you an example, okay? I gave one, but I'll give you another example. So there's this letter that Prabhupada wrote to uh, Sudama. And, um, you know, he said, when I was alone and you're in New York, it's about book distribution because that's me. I'm thinking about that, okay? I'm not trying to push book distribution. I'm just, it just happens to be the, the example I'm using because that's what I, my interest so he says, when I was alone and you're in New York, I was thinking, who will listen to me in this horrible, sinful place? Um, and he said, at least, I could, at least I could distribute a few of my books. That is something. 
but Krishna was all along planning something I could not see. He brought you young boys and girls to me one by one for doing the work of Lord Chaitanya. Now I could see it's a miracle. He said, otherwise, one old man in your city of New York with barely enough money for getting edibles, how could he survive? What to speak of starting a God conscious movement to save the whole world. So for some, when I first read that letter years ago, I can't even remember when, you know, I was very attracted by it. The way it works with me is I just I hear something Prabhupada says or I read something and I just, it just hits me. You know, I just, ooh, that's, there's something special about that, you know? And then I, when I get that feeling, I go, okay, now I gotta f f zero in on it. You know, if it's something I hear when I'm listening to a lecture, I stop it. And I, and I go, you know, look on the transcription. What did he, let me see the words, you know? And then I kind of print it out. <laughs> I'll take it, I'll, you know, I'll copy it and paste it someplace else and, and think about that. And I might discuss it with another devotee. What do you think about this? What's your understanding of this, you see? And you go deeper and deeper to it like that. So that's what happened to me with this letter. You know, I, initially I just like the whole feel of it, but then, so, and then I ask myself, well, what, what is it, what's, what is it that I'm attracted to? What, what is it that I've, um, is inspiring me about these, this particular passage? And the one thing I, that came out to me when I asked myself that question was that line about, but Krishna was all along planning something I could not see. See, so Prabhupada was expressing that, you know, even he was, you know, he's engaged in Krishna's service, but Krishna is planning something. Papa didn't know what was exactly what was going on. He said Krishna was all along planning something I could not see. And the result was he brought the boys and girls, you know, to help him you know, develop the Hare Krishna movement. So, you know, as a result of just kind of meditating on the passage and thinking about it, I got, you know, it's what I felt was some insight. And then just the other day, I got a further insight from the sentence before it. So this is getting me excited because... I'm, think, I'm seeing how, like, wow, maybe the, each sentence has some thing that you can get into. Um, in the sentence before that, he said, when I was alone and you're in New York, I was thinking, who will listen to me in this horrible, sinful place? But at least I can distribute a few of my books. That is something. So, see, so I analyzed that. I said, okay, so hmm, what's Prabhupada saying here in so many words? He's saying he's in New York and he's feeling a bit discouraged because he's looking around and he's seeing these people who are really in the modes, embedded in the modes of passion and ignorance, and he's really kind of not seeing how they could possibly be interested in Krishna consciousness because they're just so moded out. And he's feeling, you know, kind of dis discouraged by that. But then what is the next thing he says? He says, but it, well, he, I'll tell you what he didn't say first. What he doesn't say is, maybe I should just pack up and go back to India. Maybe I should give up and go back to India. And he doesn't say, when I was alone in your New York, I was thinking, who, can listen, who will listen to me in this horrible, sinful place? So perhaps I should just forget all about it and go back to India. He doesn't say that. And also what he doesn't say, when I was alone in your New York, I was thinking, who will listen to me in this horrible, sinful place? So therefore, I think I should water it down. I think I should not ask everybody to follow the four regulative principles and just make it just chant Hare Krishna and eat prasadam. He doesn't say that. What does he say? He says, but he says, but at least I can distribute a few of my books. That is something. So notice Prabhupada, while in feeling like that, his response to his own emotions, you know, his emotional uh, feeling of what this, the situation, he, the choice he made was to take shelter of book distribution. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to push book distribution, but... Uh, I'm just, this is just an example of this other point. Um, he, uh, he took shelter of book distribution. He took shelter of book distribution. That was his, that was his thing. He, the, you know, Prabhupada himself, he took shelter. You know, we're, we're, sometimes we push, or oh, we should take, get into book distribution, but Prabhupada himself took shelter of book distribution. At least I can distribute a few of my books. That is something. That's how Prabhupada was thinking. And then, and then he goes on to say, but Krishna was all along planning something I could not see. See, so I think part of that reciprocation, you know, the, 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 the fact that Prabhupada took shelter of Krishna has something to do with it. But the real point I'm trying to make is that, um, yeah, become a nerd word by word. I, I'm sorry, maybe I, I didn't mean to try to push book distribution. I'm trying to make this other point that we should really uh, meditate on Prabhupada's words, you know, it's really, um, it's, it's really potent. And it really, it, 
when you do like that, uh, it, it, it helps you appreciate and get into reading Prabhupada's books. If you, just, if you just become a sage page by page, that's okay, providing it's sinking in. That's the real point. The real point, it's got to sink in. It shouldn't, if, you, if, you, if you're reading and it's just, shh, 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 then no, it's not working, you know. You've got to tweak it. Become a sage page by page, but then in addition to that, become a nerd word by word. Really focus and think about what you're reading. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, the thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me, their lives are surrendered to me. They derive great satisfaction and bliss doing what? Not just reading and reading, 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 and rattling it off. By, enlighten, by enlightening one another and conversing about me. Now, as devotees discuss, they discuss, well, who, what's your understanding of this? Hmm, interesting. Well, this is why I understand it. And they kind of, you know, and it helps you get more absorbed, and, and that's what's important. Because ultimately, the, the, you know, the ultimate, the goal of becoming a sage page by page, and, in, and be, by the way, becoming a nerd word by word, that's not the ultimate goal either. The goal of the whole thing, of becoming a sage page by page and a nerd word by word, is to come to the point of being able to say to, pray to Krishna, Ainanda Tanujakin Karam, Patitam Mam Vishame Bhavam Budo, Kripaya Tavapada Pankaja, Stitaduli Sadvasam Vachintaya. To come to that stage of praying to Krishna, O oh, son of Maharaj Nanda Krishna, I am your eternal servant. Yet somehow or other, I fall into this ocean of birth and death. Please pick me up from this ocean of death and place me as one of the atoms at your lotus feet. So that's, you know, the whole thing, the whole, the sadhana, the sage page by page and the nerd word by word, is meant to help us come to that point where we're praying like that to Krishna, to, you know, pick me up from this uh, ocean of birth and death and place me as one of the atoms at your lotus feet. And one last point I'd like to make, and then I'll stop, is, uh, you know, in the Bhagavad Gita, you might have, those of us who've read it, everybody's read it, Krishna places a lot of emphasis on thinking of him. He says, man mana, you know, and, and, uh, in 1866, and in, oh no, 1865. And in 1864, in the purport, Papa says, Krishna is telling Arjuna, just always think of me. This, actually, this is the most important instruction in all the Vedic literatures. And then there's at least a half a dozen other places throughout the Gita where Krishna emphasizes the importance of thinking about him. For instance, another famous verse is, um, how's that one go? Anta kale chama meva smaram mukva kalevaram yat prayati samat bhavam yati nashti atra samshaya. That anybody who remembers me at the time of death alone, you know, at once, you know, when they leave their body, they attain my nature. This there, of this there is no doubt. So there's a lot of emphasis placed upon thinking of Krishna, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. So what does it mean to think of Krishna? I mean, it could mean just thinking of his pastimes and thinking of his form like that, but, and it does, you know. But here's a thought, that, and, and the, a thought I'd like to, last thought, and what I'd like to leave everybody with. Say if Sovas said to me, think, always think of me. So, and I, so I would think to myself, what is that in a meaningful way? How can I do that in a meaningful way? Should I be thinking about, you know, uh, what he's doing on his break in Hawaii, or should I be thinking about, you know, his grandson and whatever, or, you know, no, I should be thinking about what my service is, you know, thinking about my service and, and my relationship is, is based on, so in the same way, I think the most important way to think about Krishna is to think about who we are in relationship to Krishna. We're eternal servants of Krishna. And, and to think about Krishna means to think about your service, to think about how to improve your service, to think about how to increase your service, like that. That is the most important aspect of thinking about Krishna. That's my just personal realization or insight. And uh, I think it was something worth commenting on because it's, you know, Prabhupada said that's the most important instruction in all the Vedic literatures, always think of Krishna. So I'll stop there. Does anybody have any um, question? Mata. No, she's got a question, and then after that, yeah. Hare Krishna, thank you. Yeah, I was thinking, you were saying about how often Prabhupada talks about thinking about Krishna, and that's really why the movement's called Krishna Consciousness, because consciousness means to be constantly 
aware of the presence of Krishna. So that's aspiration of the devotee to see Krishna in everything and everywhere and in every being, in every action, in every thought and in every moment. Every even material things have Krishna within them. So we learn to respect and honor the material creation as part and part, as a part of Krishna and things like that. So yeah, it's true. We should think about Krishna. It's our actual consciousness. Krishna consciousness. Jai. Just a response to your thing. You know, there are people who think like you. They might not be in this community, but there are devotees who are kind of thinking like you and in that consciousness of, you know, Christ, seeing Krishna's, our responsibility to Krishna's service in, in, in broader ways in terms of the environment and this and that. They're out there. You might not find them right here in New Dwarka, but they're around. So just a thought. Uh, anybody else have a question? Yeah. That's not a question, that's a comment. Okay, any question? Okay, Maharaj had a comment. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I, <clears throat> just a brief comment, I hope it's brief. Uh, you had mentioned at the beginning, and it is mentioned very often that Krishna does c come to this world to help the living entities ultimately to come back, home, back to Godhead by giving them the higher knowledge, the higher understanding. But it doesn't start that way. Living entities have come here not to go back to Godhead. They've come here to enjoy material life. And someone has to get them out of that. The only way they can do is that material life brings pain. It brings suffering. It gives difficulty. It brings uncertainty. It brings bewilderment. It brings all these things which are negative and which cause a person to feel very, very uncertain about this life. Okay? So... The question is, is that Krishna allows the living entity to fall down and feel the pain and the suffering and the difficulties, the troubles, the trials, the trigula. He allows them to feel it until they come to the point and says, is there something better, bigger, higher, greater, more wonderful than what I'm experiencing now? Is this all there is, misery and suffering? And then Krishna comes to the rescue and he says, yes, and you come up with this book in your hand and you put it in his hand and he says, yeah. he says, there is no suffering in a higher sense. And if you begin to chant this Hare Krishna mantra, uh, uh, so a ch transformation or change or, of joy and peace and strength and love will develop in you. That's what this book is saying. So maybe I should give it a try. What does he say? The Hari Krishna. Hari. So the spiritual life gets started, like all of us here started at some point. The point usually is, is that we're just disgusted with the material world and we want something better, something higher, something greater, something which is a relief from all this. And that's what Krishna consciousness is all about. Thank it has you. a whole lifestyle in which one can. So the point I'm trying to make is that Krishna lets the devotee have his material pleasure for no other reason than he'll suffer. And that suffering will be the precursor, precursor for ultimate satisfaction, pleasure, and bliss by developing a relationship with Krishna in which there is nothing else, nothing further, nothing more than just trying to please Krishna every moment, every second every day, and always feeling you're never giving enough to Krishna. That's all I want to say. Okay, thank you. Gantarad Shrimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. 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 Jai.